season four, Rum 104. What do you guys need? I hear talking. Rum 104 behind the scenes, take two. One of the things we love about Room 104 is it is like the roulette wheel. You never know what you're going to get when you click on an episode. I have not acted in any Room 104 episodes, so I decided to write one for myself this year. No one's ever heard this song. I play this musician who, when he was 17 years old, recorded this EP called The Murderer. I found him. So you're kind of expecting this epic rock star dude, and I walk in with basically Jeff Daniels hair from Dumb and Dumber and like a bad golf shirt and cargo shorts. Can I speak with you alone, please? All around Clyde's backyard. The idea came to me because I sort of liked this really cheesy movie called Eddie and the Cruisers from the 80s that was about this mystical musician who was a hit and then disappeared. I thought, let's tell a take on that story that would be new. I killed my mom. I really killed her. Do you guys want to hear something really special? These kids start to realize that it might not be a fake story. It feels so real. Oh, yeah! Normally when I'm writing Room 104 episodes, I start out with a plan. I know what I'm gonna do. Get through a draft, give it to the group, and they fix it. That's the smart process. Star Time was not a smart process. Star Time was an instinctual, I'm going to sit down and start writing an episode because my heart is telling me there should be a girl in a room who looks really sad and a hamster who is speaking to her. Hi, hey, peace. And I had no idea what it was gonna be about. I thought, well, why would she be there? Why is she sad? What's going on? And then it really hit me that this could be an interesting story about addiction. It is that feeling that people have of, if I am not, Seeking the stars, my life is not worth living. And for a lot of people, the way to go get that, what we're calling star time, and the easiest way to get that is through some sort of addiction. And that version of the addiction story is interesting to me. Someone who is intellectually aware of what's going on, yet still not quite able to transcend it. It's star time, baby. It's time to begin. <laughs> When you look at Dave Bautista in this outfit with this wig and this hair, it's like a scene out of Dumb and Dumber, but it's also deeply sad. And that's kind of what this episode is trying to marry. Avalanche is set tangentially in the world of professional wrestling, which I just fucking love. There's so much heart in it. People know it's not real, but they choose to suspend their disbelief. And that, to me, touches on something very similar, which is the nature of personal trauma. We couldn't tell anybody what we did here, because we might get in trouble. We've been talking for a while about doing an episode where we built a little doll-sized set of Room 104 and having people work with the dolls. And when I came up with this wrestler idea and the trauma and how therapists often work with dolls, I came up with the first draft of Avalanche. Is that a real memory? Did something happen to that little boy? Try to remember. For me, this episode is more about the discovery for him of something terrible happened to me and I'm not gonna be able to just beat the shit out of large men in order to keep this at bay. I'm gonna have to take a look at it and figure it out. I am not a violent person! Janae Lamarck brought us the concept of bangs. She said, I wanna make a feminist version of The Christmas Carol where a woman keeps cutting her bangs and changing personas. We could see where the night takes us. I immediately knew we were gonna make it off of that pitch. I had this sentence float through my head one day. You become a different girl with every millimeter of bang you cut. <sighs> and then I remember she said, and it'll be great because like the scissors will have this great sound effect that just goes shing. And I was like, all right, just go do it. Each time she cuts her bangs, she's visited by a ghost of her past. Are you even 18? Her present or future. They look great, babe. Oh my God. 
are you doing here? To save you from whoever is doing that to your hair. The room is decorated like a bachelorette party. There's giant inflated penises everywhere. Those penises just kept sneaking their way into every shot. They were over the shot, <laughs> every shot. This is so fucking surreal. What the f It's okay, maybe we watch our language in front of the kids. Yes, good, cut, that's great. This episode stuck in a sitcom started off with this strange existential moment I had where I was watching a promo for Tim Allen's show, Last Man Standing. I was looking at it and I was like, this is just home improvement again. And he's just doing the same shit 20 years later. Someone help me, please. And then I thought, well, that could be fun to hyperbolically show that in an episode where a male actor in a sitcom starts to realize existentially that he is, in fact, living inside of a sitcom. <laughs> so we kind of try to wrap it all up in this fun episode of a traditional sitcom actor who realizes, holy shit, I'm stuck here. How the hell do I get out? Oh my God, you're not gonna believe this. What? <laughs> that is so beautifully extra. Hikers was a fun episode to make because Lauren Budd knew how to voice people that age in a way that me at 42, I just can't do with that sort of veracity. It's essentially an analysis of what frenemies really are and wrote it so with such a clear vision of how these girls would speak and behave and downright despicable behavior. All those times you needed a friend, who was there? And trust me, I do it out of love. I no idea how you live inside your body. I give up, I give up. You know, just stay repulsive. I'm gonna take a hike. The story behind the phone party episode was conformity. I used to move around a lot. I never really felt like I belonged until the... So we took the theme of conformity, and then we decided to make a horror episode where a man throws a phone party for his friends. <laughs> oh my God! What the fuck is going on, Jack? And as the foam touches them, they all start to slowly but surely turn into him. <laughs> Don't leave me out here! No, this can't be happening. Shit tons of foam coming into the room, action sequences. We've always stayed away from this idea because we knew it was going to wreak havoc in the room. This crap's gonna leave residue everywhere. Oh, residue, oh, that sounds bad. That sounds really, really bad. <laughs> but it's season four, so we just said, fuck it. <laughs> Oh, holy smokes, a genuine no-dice buzzer. Even I don't have one of these. When we started writing the episode <laughs> No Dice, it came from my love of game shows and game show hosts. It always struck me how difficult it must be for these men to smile so consistently when you know, deep down, they hate their jobs. Uh -huh. So we thought we would build this sort of fictional game show host character played by Gary Cole. Are you? Are ready to roll! Who has sort of like a, a transformational night in, in Room 104. What makes a guy like Chip turn to the good? For us, I think the answer was, guys like that don't really feel needed. They feel used for what they can do to make money. It's never enough. You just want more. They feel worshiped from afar based on a persona that's not really them. What I really, really love about No Dice is you, Chip. In my projection, they never really feel the need of like a human being saying, I think you are great, and me relating to you and having this experience with you human to human is going to bring value to me. Oh, Chip, thank you so much. You're welcome. I will be victorious. Julian Wass and I teamed up and said, what if we tried to make a truly epic battling, time traveling, musical episode that is an homage to movies like The Highlander and The Terminator? One When we 
sat down with the whole crew after they read the script, who were admittedly kind of confused as to what the tone of it is. What we said was, this episode is ridiculous, and it is over the top, and it is a farce and a parody, but that doesn't mean we don't take it absolutely seriously. I think it all up comes to absolutely nothing. So Julian and I got together, and all of a sudden we hire these Broadway actors and singers, and it just turns into a thing. It's probably the most fun thing we do on Room 104. <laughs> When we came up with the concept for The Night Babby Died, it was based on something that happened to my brother and myself when we were younger. So we're going back to 8-bit video gaming from the early 80s. What if I told you that I found a way to bring Babby back? The essence of Room 104 is collaboration. So in sharing this story with Julian Wass and Janae Lamarck, who is our co-writer and our director, these people have such different creative engines than I do. And so what started as this show that was, okay, this will be funny and really interesting and kind of awkward. Janae had this great idea to make their friendship one where you have a massive class divide, but emotionally they're equals. And it was just something that was a real surprise how much we could flesh that out. So when I was talking to Julian Wass about it, he immediately said, oh, this could be an incredible episode about a character that two children really, really loved, and they come back together 30 years later, and they unearth a deep family secret. That's Pappy, right? We've been talking for a while about making an animated episode for Room 104, but it was really, really hard for us to find the right idea. And then Mel Eslin told us the story of how these girls would sometimes sneak into motel rooms while the cleaning service was there, hide under the bed, and then wait for the cleaning service to leave, and then the room was clean, and if no one was checking in, they would have the room for themselves. We're in. The concept of fur is essentially these two girls are hanging out in the room, and one of them has hit puberty and one of them hasn't. To our last summer, before it all, like, begins. And they're referring to it as their fur. Can I see it? You soon come to realize that these girls are latent werewolves, and the boy that they have invited to come over is trying to destroy them. You will never take me! So you get this really fun, pulpy, werewolves versus the monster episode as a really fun feminist premise. But it's also, at its core, about girls learning how to not cannibalize each other in their friendships over boys. We should let him be. He's just a boy. And learning the power of friendship for women. I told you you'd get your fur. I'm just glad it came in time, and you were, like, here for it. For sure, we gotta stick together. Yeah, for sure. Generations upon generations of sacrifice, so the generations upon generations may prosper. We all had this idea for years that at a certain point, someone presses a button on the wall and everyone goes weightless in the room. And that was how we reverse engineered the generation story. We wanted to come up with something that was behind it that could really make this feel about something. If you were making a mission to go really, really far from Earth as to where it was gonna take about like 150 years, you would have to have these sort of passengers who know they would not make it and were only there to procreate so that the next generation could thrive and get there. It's not about us, it's about the mission the future. And that seems very, very similar to how a lot of first-generation immigrants describe their experience. For this sacrifice, we ask not for your gratitude, but for your remembrance. They essentially sacrificed their quality of life so they could get themselves to America, plant the seeds, so that the next generation could then prosper from it. You will be remembered, Wendy Okafor. But what does that mean if you were that first generation person and you're at the end of your life and you're looking back and saying, the only value of what I set up for myself was to be a stepping stone for someone else to go. And do you feel resentful about that? Or do you love your children enough to feel good about that? 
You hated her for forcing you into this life. Life? How is this a life? So that the whole episode is sort of an examination of that. I am so lucky to have HBO here who like lets me make this weird shit in this incubator. And it was such a wonderful experience for us. Got it?